As we've been doing, our prelude this morning is going to be a song service, so I want to invite our youth choristers up and invite you to pull out your hymnals and let us all sing with joy. Welcome uh, Melody, our pianist here today. She is going to help us make this happen. What's our first song? Our first song is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, which is hymn number 538. next song will be When We All Get to Heaven, which is hymn number 633.
heaven when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus Just keep it going Just we'll sing and shout the victory stand for our last song in a little while we're going home which is hymn number 626 Thank you. 
Today's call from tall, excuse me. Today's call to worship comes from Psalms 85 verses 7 through 9. It can be found in your Pew Bible on page 547. Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near, those who follow, those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Well, this is the third week of our old-fashioned Words of Life camp meeting. And so if you haven't been with us these other two weeks, I believe you can go onto our website and see the entire service, at least what we got before batteries run out, because these are longer worship services. So buckle in and uh, be prepared. Delighted that you have uh, uh, come again today and that we have this time in worship together, the worship of our God. As we continue with this theme, I want to charge you as we go forward, as today is our last day, to think about the ways in which God has spoken to you, the ways in which uh, you have been moved through this, and those things that have been a part of our worship and service that we may want to consider lacing through the services in the year to come. I want to point your attention, too, as we talk about our theme, to the fact that today is actually our biggest day in camp meeting. We have the most full program, and if you look at the very front of your program, you can see that that is, in fact, the case. Uh, The dismissal time is not listed, but I hope to uh, turn out lights at 10.15 tonight. (laughs) So we do have a little marathon uh, uh, going. Let me just give you a few highlights very quickly. After our divine worship hour today, we will have lunch again. It's going to be a picnic potluck style lunch as we've done the last two Sabbaths. Uh, My gratitude to Marty Barkley and the women of the church who've put that together. It's just been great. And then in the afternoon, we're going to gather in the fireside room as we did last week. Uh, We may have a few moments for prayer, reflection, and a song before we hear from Milton Hinkle. His word of life is trust. And then we'll have a little break, and uh, we're going to hear from Bunny Thornburg, and her word of life is sing. Uh, And then we're going to have a little break, and then we're going to hear from Rick Rothler, and his word is people. So I think you're going to love this. These are short talks. We have a chance to interact at the end of these, and it's a good time. Last week, Dr. Maury Jackson was with us for a Connection Spiritual Life Seminar. If you were here last week and received a booklet and uh, so forth, I strongly urge you to attend. If you were not here last week but just like to kind of hang out and see what that was all about, feel free. Uh, Dr. Jackson does a great job. When we're done with that, around 5.30, we're going to have a small supper. It's going to be very light, kind of a taco salad or haystacks, as we call it, kind of thing. And then we hope to gather back here in the sanctuary for some singing, Bible question and answer time. Our speakers are going to be on a panel here, which we'll moderate, and then uh, we'll hopefully have a few testimonies as well. At 8 o'clock, we come to our prayer time and end the Sabbath, and we'll go on over to the MPR for game night. Uh, I, I made somebody in Sabbath school cry when I mentioned that we were going to be having root beer floats and uh, corn dogs. So if you're looking for some good old-fashioned, not-so-good-for-you Adventist soul food, there it is. All right, blessings as we worship together. Silly me. And out of the theme, we do have a theme song, do we not? Wonderful Words of Life, number 286. Please stand and sing it with me. I know you know it now after two weeks. Wonderful words of life. I'm going to ask our youth group to join me in leading this. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty. 
teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, moving us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, beautiful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of God. At this point, I'd like to invite you all to kneel as we prepare for prayer. Father, we thank you for the invitation to set aside our lives, set aside our burdens, and spend a, a, spend a day with you on this Holy Sabbath. And especially we're happy to be here with you in this place with other travelers. We ask, Lord, a special measure of your grace to be with us all. Remove our burdens. Heal us, deliver us from temptations, and we thank you, Lord, that you have so graciously forgiven us where we have fallen. We ask, Lord, today that you be with us all day as we think upon your words, your words of life. May the beauty of your life shine from our hearts and our hands. In Christ's name, amen. So we now take just a couple of moments to address our family matters. The first item on our agenda is that 
Our member Lee Ruglas and his family are not with us this morning. Lee's father went to his rest yesterday at the age of 93. And so we need to uh, reach out both in prayer and uh, tangibly to Lee and his family and give him the comfort that uh, they so much need in this time of loss. This is the last Sabbath of July. August is coming, and for parts of our church family, August is a very busy month. On August 10th, just two weeks from tomorrow, a group of our church members are headed to Oshkosh, Wisconsin for the International Campery for the Pathfinder Organization. Uh, Pastor Greg and I and uh, Jill and uh, Silva family and the Via family and many others, Derek Greaves, we're all going back for that. And uh, one of the highlights of that will be that three weeks from today, Pastor Greg and I will enter a large tank with Jason Via. And together we will baptize Jason. And we've been looking forward to this, and especially Jason has, since the last Oshkosh five years ago. So we ask you to uh, pray for our group and uh, celebrate with us both our travels and uh, the wonderful things that will happen when 45,000 Adventist young people get together uh, in Wisconsin. The moment we get back from Wisconsin, actually before we even get back that Sunday, Family Promise kicks off for the third time this year. They will be, um, this is the, the week where we host uh, some homeless families in our congregation as those families are uh, getting back into the workforce and getting their economics back together. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby, and uh, my understanding is that there are lots of gaps there. There are gaps for every hour of the day and night spread throughout the entire seven days, starting Sunday morning or possibly even the Saturday night before, and working through that entire week until late Sunday. So if you in the summertime could find a few hours, whether that's uh, late afternoon, evening, early morning, uh, overnight stay away from home and the chaos that might be happening there. It's very peaceful here uh, during the night. Uh, look at that sign-up sheet and be a part of that important ministry for our church family. Finally, that same week that we're coming back from Oshkosh and Family Promise is kicking off, that's also when our Adventist school system starts up. Crescenta Adventist School begins that week, as does Glendale Adventist Academy. Those are the two schools that our congregation supports in a significant way, and uh, we want to uh, make you aware of that. And if you are looking for some options, it's not too late to, uh, to make some changes and uh, take a look at what our Christian education has to offer your family. Remember the potluck and so on that we're having after church today that will take care of your physical needs and following our spiritual food this morning. Thank you and may God bless us as we worship together. When the pastor first called me this week to ask if I would do the um, Offertory testimony, of course, I was a little nervous because talking about money is never a comfortable subject. Uh, but he listed a few things that made him be encouraged to call to ask me. One of them being um, that I am a pastor's daughter, uh, and then also because he likes to make fun of me because I like to clip coupons, and I do price matching at Walmart, because uh, I'm a stay-at-home wife, and that is my job to try to save as much money as possible. But I'm going to start at the beginning um, so that you can kind of know my background and uh, the story of where I came from and my, the example that was set for me because I can't really separate that from who I am and, um, the, um, you know, obviously the programming that was instilled in me at a young age. By the time I came around, my parents were actually almost 40. I was a bit of a surprise child. Uh, and by then, my, my dad had been a pastor earlier in New Jersey, but by the time I came around, he was actually a chaplain at Blue Mountain Academy. Not really a bump up in pay, though, pretty much on the same playing field, probably, for uh, financial, in financial terms. My mother, though, was a very dedicated woman. She got her teaching degree, and she decided when my brother came along, which was 12 years before me, that she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, which is not an easy thing to do when your husband is a pastor. But she was very committed, and I must say this about my mother, 
She is probably the most spiritual and filled woman, full of prayer and just completely trusting that God will provide. I cannot tell you how many times in my life I've heard her say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust that God's going to provide. And no matter what happens, I know that God will provide in whatever way does work out was the way that he intended. And that was kind of the example that she set for me. And because of that prayer, I believe that God provided in many ways. In Pennsylvania, they were able to live in a house, and we moved to Ohio when I was three. They were able to build their own house. And not just one, we built two. The second one was my mother's dream home, which by many standards in California, you probably look at and say, I don't know about that. But it was about 3,600 square feet, and we were on five acres, and we had a pool. It wasn't anything fancy, but it was my mother's dream. And that was the bulk of my growing up years was in that house. And remember, my, by this time, by the time I went to school in fifth grade, because I was homeschooled, I had my mom had been at home for maybe two decades, but when I went to school in fifth grade, she decided to go back to school as a kindergarten teacher. Still not a lot of money, and my dad was still being a teacher. So I don't know where the money came from. I don't know how we were able to build two houses. I don't know how we were able to eat and pay for cars and to survive, but things were always comfortable. We weren't walking around with Rolexes, but we were definitely given everything that we possibly could, given lessons, um, went to private academy, and got the, the Lord just provided. And that's something my mom always says, is God just provides. And I, to this day, I still don't know where the money came from. My parents are able to retire. They live in Menifee, if you guys are familiar with Menifee. Uh, they bought a brand new house. They have a brand new car. I don't know where the money came from. They're not flashy people. I don't know if that's contradictory to what I'm saying, but they're not very flashy people. Um, they retired on a pastor's salary and a teacher's salary, and yet God has provided for them. They have been consistently faithful with giving tithes and offerings. Um, in fact, my parents have taken in so many kids as second children and third children and, and families that I couldn't even tell you how many people call them mom and dad that aren't related to them by blood because of how they have provided for other people. So with that great example, I'm not going to shock you a little bit with how my story started. Let's fast forward to when I first started paying tithe. I grew up in a very large church, I mean huge. And I remember the very first time that I felt compelled in my heart, like, you know, I really need to give something to God this week. Monetarily speaking, I know that this is something I need to do. I'm making money now. I'm going to write my first check. So here I go. I'm writing my check. I deposit it at church. Tax season comes. <laughs> By then I had moved to California from Ohio. Tax season comes and I didn't get a receipt from the church. And I was thinking, man, I gave him a huge check. I mean, this must have been substantial. I probably have like a wing on the church. It wasn't that bad. That was a little exaggeration. But I don't know where my receipt is. So I call the church. They send me the receipt. And I open it up. I'm not going to list the exact exact amount that it was, but let's just say that it was double digits, and it was on the lower end of the double digits, and it was a little bit surprising and a bit of a reality check when I saw in that paper what I had thought to be this huge contrib uh, contribution to the church was just this really small number. By that, But you have to understand, even though I knew my parents gave to the church, it wasn't something that they said, see, we're writing out X amount of dollars. See, look at it. Okay, we're putting this slip. It was more like, here's your few dollars, take it to offering, put it in the offering basket at church. That, that was kind of what I knew to do. So this was kind of my first bump into adulthood, if you will, where I had to come to terms with what am I going to do for giving personally, on a personal level. And I'm going to take you to the word real quick, a verse that really changed uh, me. And, and this was a gradual journey, but this was the first verse that kind of came to be something that... Um, really influenced how I looked at giving. It's probably one you've heard before, but it's in Malachi 3, verse 8 to 10. It says, Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that, they, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. There are two things that really stood out to me that kind of 
got lodged in my brain that I kind of started to mull over during this time. One was, I'm robbing God. My mindset originally had been, God understands. I don't make that much money living in Southern California, getting paid peanuts. Like, I really need this money. He understands that when I get to make some more money, you know, when I get older, get married, then I'll be able to give him more money, right? But this verse said to me, no matter how much I'm making, I'm robbing God. It's not just me. Maybe the church needs it, but it's not. It's bigger than that. It's saying, God, I'm robbing from you what is rightfully yours. And the second thing was, this is a test. How are you going to respond? How am I going to respond to when God says, you need to step out on a ledge of faith and acknowledge, I am God, that I will provide. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? That is a simple question in this verse for me. And it really made me think, do I trust God? When I sit down in the pew, when I feel compelled to give something, is it something that inside I'm saying, I trust you, God. I'm going to write this check because I trust you. Or am I saying, I don't trust that you're going to provide for me, so I'm just going to hoard it all to myself and keep it close to me, keep it in my bank account because I feel safer that way. So which decision am I going to make? Because ultimately that's what it comes down to. During this time, my brother started going to a different church, not an Adventist church, but he came to me one day and said, we're doing this study in a book, and it's talking about being able to eliminate your debt. Because the more you can eliminate your debt, be it pay off your mortgages or pay off your property, then you can be more responsible and be more generous to the church and to those who are needing it. That was something else that lodged in my head. How am I being responsible? Am I, am I, is my money making a difference in the long run? So those were kind of the, the, the perfect storm that was kind of going on in my mind, coupled with the example that my parents had set in my growing up years. Soon after that, I was fortunate enough to marry my husband. And I have to say this about my husband. He is, I deal with all the money stuff at home, all the bills, Anything that has to do with inside the house, I pretty much deal with that. But there's one thing that he does that's monetary, which is he does all of the tithing um, and the offerings and stuff. And he is the most faithful giver. I mean, I, I just look to him as an example because no matter what kind of situation we've been in, he is very faithful in saying, this is what we need to do and this is how much we're giving. When we first got engaged... He told me that he was going to move to Los Angeles, which was not my first choice. In fact, what I told him was, you can move me anywhere in the country except Los Angeles. And then I got the call, we're moving to Los Angeles, which was not very exciting. And when we first drove into the city and he said, okay, this is the area you have to pick from to live, I wanted to get out of the car and run back to Ohio in a flash and just, you know, Chuck the ring back at him. But that's not what I want. That's not what happened. I knew that God wanted me to be with him. And so I suffered through. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Uh, a couple years being in Los Angeles. Uh, I had to quit my job to move. And for me, I know that a job is typically the ego for a man, like he needs to feel like he provides. But there's something instilled in me where I feel like I need to work. And so when I had to quit to move to Los Angeles, there was a certain amount of, I felt like I was losing control. I didn't feel like I could really spend any money. I felt like we had to be uber frugal, which is when the couponing and price matching started. Um, And it was just a sense of loss of control because I thought, what if my husband loses his job and I'm not working? What are we going to do? We're living in, we're paying like $2,000 a month of rent. I mean, what are we going to do? We can't, we're just starting off in a marriage. How are we going to survive? My husband got a job with a company called Rhythm and Hughes. He does, um, for those people who don't know, he does animation. And animation, even though you're hired by a company, you're on basically a contract basis. So the first company he worked with was Rhythm and Hughes. And he was working on the, uh, the chipmunk squeakle. And when that project was up, they basically told him, you can hang around, but we don't have any projects for a while, so you'll be without pay. We don't know how long, just until we get, pick up another project and start working. Then I started to get really nervous. It's like, we moved to L.A., we're in this really high-priced apartment. What are we going to do if you lose your job? 
we're going to be moving back in with our parents. Like, I started to get really stressed. And then I started to remember, no, we have been faithful. I'm trusting that God will provide. And I started claiming promises from the Bible, the, the one that I just read from you, for you being one. I can't even tell you the number of doors that got open, but the next door open was that he was able to go to Sony. And that he started that job within weeks of finishing his last job. I mean, it just opened. I mean, there was just no delay. There was hardly any stress. He interviewed, he got the job, and then it, he, he was able to start within a couple weeks. And it was just like God saying, I'm going to provide for you. And that kind of encouraged me on that front of tithing and to continue to give because I knew that God would take care of us. Uh, he was at Sony for a couple years, and due to some moral questions with the next project that was coming up, because he finished one, and they said, okay, this is the next project you're going to work on. And he wasn't very comfortable with the material for that movie. And he decided that he was going to say, I, I can't work on this movie. And I very much understood, and I supported him. I knew that, that that's what God would want, but at the same time, it's a little nerve-wracking thinking, okay, I'm still not working, I'm a stay-at-home wife, and you're not taking this job, which is guaranteed money. That's okay, we're going to put our faith in God, let's just pray about it. So about that time, he decided, I'm going to apply for Disney, I think, which was, it was his dream job was to work for Disney, and there was something I was a little bit nervous about because we knew other people had tried to get into Disney and they couldn't. And so I, it was just a lot of prayer, to be honest. But we continued giving. We were at a church then. Um, and the pastor's philosophy was, if you're tried financially, it's the devil trying to tempt you, and you need to double tithe. And I don't know that we always followed that during that time. Uh, but that was kind of the mentality, was that trust that God's going to provide. Don't give up on giving just because the devil is starting to get in your way and start put up wall, uh, walls and blockages where you might not be able to continue giving. I must say that God opened the door for him to go to Disney. And the really neat thing was that when we were in Los Angeles, one of the things that was really hard on me was thinking we could never buy real estate in that area. I thought we might be able to end up with a condo or two-bedroom condo. So when he got the job at Disney, we started looking for real estate up in Santa Clarita, which was like a dream come true for me because I never thought I'd get out of the city, and I'm a country girl. I mean, give me some sweet tea, put me on the front porch in a rocking chair, and blast the country music. That's kind of my style. And so to be in Los Angeles is kind of like the opposite. So to even think of getting up to Santa Clarita was just absolutely um, an answer to prayer, and I could do nothing but fall on my knees and just praise God. That week, we gave a larger offering to the church as a thank you because I just said, God, how do I even question that, you, that you're going to provide for me? We were able to buy a, a four-bedroom house instead of a two-bedroom condo. We had a yard. And I just, there's no other way for me to explain it than I just sometimes look up to God and I say, how do I ever deserve this, God? How did I ever deserve this life that you've given me? And please don't ever let me be naive enough to think, it's anything that I did or that Matthew did or that it couldn't be taken away tomorrow. But I am just thankful, so very thankful, that we have what we have that you have provided in the way that you've provided in this very moment. And thank you so much to, for showing me that you can be trusted. God promises before you call, I will answer. He will provide great gifts. He knows how to give good, good gifts to his children. If we will just be responsible and faithful enough to stand up and say, I am willing to trust you. At this time, I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward. The loose offerings today are for um, the conference disaster relief. If you bow your heads with me, I'm going to say a quick prayer. God, I thank you so much for proving yourself faithful, for, sh for showing us that we can trust you. If we would just step out on that ledge and say, I'm choosing today to put my trust and my faith in you and to show that in a financial sense, which we all take so very seriously. I ask that you'll bless this money that is given, double it and triple it, and use it for your honor and glory. In your name I pray, amen.
doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we give you but thine own. Take it and use it as you see fit and glorify your kingdom yourself. For we give you honor, praise, and thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I'd like to invite Kathy Ferrar up to share our children's story with our children. And children, you're invited to come forward at this time. Good morning. So nice to see all you here this morning, you smiling faces. My story today is about little Billy. Now, little Billy had had a birthday, and one of his presents was this kit to make a big boat. But in doing so, he had all these little parts that he had to use and put together. Now, Mommy was home in the kitchen, and Billy was working on his kit in the dining room table. Daddy happened to be gone on a trip, so it was just Mommy and Billy at home. And Mommy was cooking in the kitchen, and Billy was working on his project. And pretty soon, Mommy heard something that Billy was saying, and so she went over to the kitchen, I mean the door, and looked into the kitchen table where he was working, and Billy had just gotten off his knees and he was saying, nothing matters, just nothing matters. And Mommy said, what, Billy, what doesn't matter? Well, he's not helping me. I asked him to help me, and Jesus isn't helping me. And Mommy said, well, you know what, Billy? You've been working on this project for a while now. And you might be a little tired. And you know what? Jesus does help us. He just doesn't always help us in the way we think he should be helping us or how fast he should be helping us. So Billy said, all right, Mommy. And Billy got ready for bed. He thought a little bit, but he still said, OK, I will kneel down and say my prayers. And one more time, I'm going to ask Jesus, tomorrow morning, maybe Jesus will help me put it together. And so Mommy said, sure, Billy, Jesus is always with us, and he will always help us. With that, Billy went to sleep, and Mommy went back cleaning up the kitchen. And then you know what? She had a thought come into her mind. What if... I read the instructions. Maybe I can put it together for Billy. And so, you know, she got out the screwdrivers and she got out all these little parts that she's never done that before. She says, I'm not an engineer. I hardly know how to use these things. No wonder Billy was having a hard time with those little fingers and these little parts. And so way into the night, she worked on fixing that project of his, that little boat, and she finally got it done. It was late, and Mom was really tired. But she was happy that she was able to get it put together for him. So she crept up to his bedroom and put it right by his nightstand. Early in the morning, Billy woke up, 
And he ran to his mommy's room and said, Mommy, Mommy, wake up, wake up. You know what? Jesus made my boat for me last night. And Mommy said, Oh, really? That's wonderful. Then Billy got to thinking, Well, I don't know if that was Jesus who built that boat. Mommy, was it you? And Mommy had to say, Yes, Billy, I did fix your boat for you. But you know what Jesus did? While I was cleaning the kitchen, he had this little thought in my mind that said, Go fix Billy's boat for him. And you know what? I listened to Jesus, and I went over there, and I fixed that boat for you till very late at night. And do you know what? Jesus uses all of us in different ways to help other people to answer their prayers. Have you ever thought of that? Do you know what? We, too, need to th remember that when we have a thought, maybe in our mind, that says, Oh, you know what? It's Taya's birthday tomorrow. Maybe I should get a birthday card for her. Do you think I should say, Ah, oh, that's okay. Taya will get a bunch from her grandma and her family. Or should I listen to that and say, Maybe I should go do that. Or you know what? You may say, I saw that person over there. She needs some help. Should I go help them? Maybe she's been answering, asking Jesus to help her, and maybe you're the one to go and help her. And so all of us need to remember to develop in our minds that we need to listen to Jesus for many ways that we can answer other people's prayers, too, and be a help to Jesus. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for the little promptings you give us Help us to remember to listen to them and act on them and be your helpers to answer other people's prayers. Thank you. Amen. Today's reading can be found in 2 Peter. It's ver chap chapter 3, verses 3 through 15. On your, in your pew Bible, it's on page 1,127 and 28. Above all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors' eyes, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by 
deluge and by these waters also the world of this time was deluged and destroyed by the same word that the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly but do not forget this one thing dear friends with the lord a day is like a thousand years a thousand years are like a day the lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some of, as some of you understand slowness instead he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance but the day of the lord will come like a thief the heavens will disappear with a roar the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare since everything will be destroyed in this way what kind of people ought you to be you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of god and speed its coming that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat but in keeping with his promise we are looking forward to a new heaven and new earth where all righteousness dwells so then dear friends since you are looking forward to this make every effort to be found spotless blameless and at peace with him bear in mind that our lord's patience means salvation just as our dear brothers paul also wrote also wrote you with the wisdom that god gave him now i know that you are not seated on the hard metal chairs of camp meeting but I am guessing that if you're like me, you could probably use a stretch. So let's uh, stand up. Take a breath in. Just, uh, yes, stretch your back a little. Say hello to a neighbor real quick. Get it out of your system. Put your cell phone on vibrate. There's an exercise for you. Put your cell phone on vibrate. And have a seat. I can't believe all the rich and important things that we've been a part of already this morning. We've sung praise to God. We've listened to his word being read. We've heard testimony about God's working in someone's life and bringing them to convictions about how they ought to live in light of stewardship. Thank you, Renal. We've listened to our youth and our choir, and We've been in touch one with the other. God has done very special things already in this place. But we have one more, a couple more tasks ahead of us, and one is to receive words of promise. So I hope you'll bear with me in this brief survey this, this afternoon. It starts in Genesis very early on. It's just a hint that we get of a sacrificial system when Adam and Eve have sinned and they have hid from God and declared themselves naked and God prepares for them skins to wear. We get just the sort of foretaste of what's coming in terms of the sacrificial system that would develop. But embedded in the words of curse is a word of promise. One will come. You will deliver a son. And he will bruise the serpent's head, and the serpent will bruise his heel. And in that brief text, we have the promise of something that's going to come, that's going to change history and our lives forever. 
But throughout salvation, history promises have come in various forms, some for the long haul and the big picture, some in the shorter haul and for the littler picture. There was a man named Abram of Ur, and God appeared to him with a command and a promise. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. He left his city and went. Abraham obeyed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He wasn't a perfect person by any stretch, but he listened, and he acted, and he believed the promise. And the promise was twofold. I'm going to give you a land to inherit, and I'm going to make your descendants as the sands of the sea. A lot of descendants. He tried to live this out. You know the story. It didn't quite happen the way he thought it might. And then it did. A little diversion there with Hagar and Ishmael. But ultimately Isaac, laughter, came into the picture. Joy was born into the house of Abraham now and Sarah. And the promise was fulfilled. By the time two generations have passed, we have the 12 tribes of Israel represented in 12 sons of Jacob. Well, actually, one son is disinherited and two of Joseph's are chosen, right? And the promise goes forward and God makes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a nation. And in the context of that nation, the promise is looked forward to that God would one day send a Messiah, a deliverer. And so the first part of salvation history is this hint of a sacrificial system that develops during the Exodus and beyond into a full-on system for dealing with sin. Guilt placed upon the offerings, the burnt offerings, the sacrificial offerings. And as long as God's word about what was to be sacrificed and how was followed, things went well for the people. As long as they kept covenant, which was the relationship of promise that they were in, things went well for the people. When they didn't, it went very badly for them. But the promise shifts or at least expands as the Messiah comes. Not only do the people fail to recognize it, but now we have the arrival of Christ who's not just a Messiah in the order in which people had come to expect. He's the one who's going to crush the serpent's head. His kingdom is not going to be of this world. His kingdom is going to be of another world. And he's going to expand the idea of promise and salvation in ways that it hadn't been understood. You see, he would deliver us from oppression, but not oppression of a military sort or a civic or governmental sort. He'd deliver us from an oppression of sin. Paul says it nicely. We're slaves to sin unless we've been freed. Jesus said, if you've, been, if you've been freed, be free indeed. So in Jesus, we have a new kind of promise, a Messiah, one who comes and delivers. And what we are told is that if we believe, we will be saved. Belief and salvation become intimately connected. It's not a series of rituals anymore. Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. There can be no more sacrifice. The temple will not work because he is the embodiment of temple, and he lives in you and me, living temples. So now he comes not as part of a sacrificial system, but the fulfillment of it and a new order comes to be, if you will believe, you will have life. Now, belief is not passive there. It's not this sort of gallop pull American belief where supposedly 94% of Americans believe in God. 
you wouldn't know it from what you see in the media, would you? No answer on that? I, I don't see it. But we're not talking about that kind of belief. Scriptures talk about that kind of belief and say, yes, the devil believes also and trembles. So if the devil even is moved by his belief and the power of it, then we ought to be even more so. And we're to be we're to be believers in the sense that we don't just assent to a truth, we live it. That we make our home in Christ, we abide in Him, and He abides in us. We live in Him, He lives in us. Make sense? This isn't a casual arrangement. The promise that comes to us now is that He wants to make His dwelling not with us, but in us that he doesn't want to live out his life separate from us, but through us. The promise now is that we can have life, and it's a Greek thing. We don't have it really in English, but it's called eris punctilier. It starts at the moment and moves on through time, now and forevermore. You see, salvation has come to our house now, not in the future, but it remains intact, ever coming to us now and into the future. We live in Christ, in Him we live and move and have our being and His righteousness covers our sins and His righteousness is our righteousness. And we become like Him. We become changed. And that promise carries forward into a different kind of reality, both for Christ and for us. As He ascends back to the Father, he takes on a different kind of role, according to Hebrews. He becomes like a high priest for us, almost a throwback to the old system, and yet it's not. He's not a high priest supervising sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is now continuing a priestly work that we might continue to come to him, continue to find cleansing, and that we might all be saved if possible. Hebrews 8 talks about what I want to get at if you have a moment to look at your scripture. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Jesus is a high priest, but of a sort of symbolic and new covenant sort. There's a new sort of better promise in operating form here. 8, verse 1. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up the Lord, not a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifice, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests there who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at the sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern you're shown on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior, superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. Interesting. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another, but God found fault with the people and said, when the days are coming, declared the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. It's based on a superior promise, a better promise. Christ our high priest based on a better promise. 
I will be your God and you will be my people. I'm no longer going to have what you need to do external to you. I'm going to write it on your hearts and your minds. I'm going to send you a comforter, a spirit, and he will lead you and guide you. She will lead you and guide you. The spirit will lead you and guide you in all things. New covenant, new promise. Jesus, before he goes back to heaven and sits at the right hand of God and becomes this priest for us, makes yet another promise. He says, I'm coming back. And if I come back, I'm going to take you to be with me. This is where we sit. We can talk about what we don't see. We can talk about what's been, but it's very difficult. After 150 years of Adventist preaching, in camp meetings no less, to talk about what will be and hasn't been yet. Through the years, I've heard fewer and fewer sermons on the second coming of Jesus. Have we lost our faith? Is it just old news? Have we grown to think of it as it will be when it will be? It's not all bad. Jesus says, I will come again and take you to be with me. It doesn't do us much good to believe the old promises and to neglect that one. Because it takes us from what is understood as the reign of God here and now, a reign in which not everyone has bowed the knee or confessed, a reign in which so many of the citizens of this earth are yet in compliance have yet to receive, have yet to understand. They've been reconciled to God in Christ, but they've yet to accept that and reach out for that. And so we're still a planet in rebellion. The whole plan is not yet fulfilled or implemented. The promises still have another fulfillment. Our text today spoke of this powerfully, I think. Second Peter was read for us. Maybe what I'm hinting at is verse 3 where it says, you must understand in the last, last days scoffers will come. Where is this coming he has promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And then the argument is this. What they forget is that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came to be and the earth was formed. And by the waters that separated land and the water, by the separation of waters and land, the earth also came to be destroyed by flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept until the day of judgment. Peter reminds us of these things, and he says this. Don't forget this, he says. A day for the Lord is what? is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. I am so finite in my reckoning of time, and not that good at it, by the way, as my wife will attest. I've gotten better, but my sense of time is not always the best. I have a very loose relationship with time, a very fluid relationship with time. Any of you like me? There's several personalities out there. Oh, come on. Two people? Oh, so all the rest of you have a very rigid relationship with time. You're never late for anything. You're five minutes early for everything. You always know what time it is. You're always cognizant of what's going on. That's the rest of you? I'm in the wrong church. 
Or maybe I am in the right church. Glory be. Well, I have a very fluid relationship with time. I can only imagine how fluid God's relationship to time might be. When you're the Lord of time, when you're the God of time, would not you uh, do things on your own schedule? Yes, no? I would do things on my schedule were I the God of time. I pretty much do anyway, and I'm not even the God of time. <laughs> and I mean no disrespect by that. You, you, for those of you who are really timely, people might, like me are not trying to be disrespectful. We, we, it's not that we don't appreciate timely people. We just don't think that way. I have a little bit of sort of this, if I am two minutes early, I have just wasted two minutes. That's kind of how I think about life. And uh, I'm trying, I'm getting better. I'm working at that. I'm working really hard at that. And uh, God is patient with me. But the God of all time promises that our sense of time is pretty much irrelevant here. He says he's coming back. And Peter reminds us that a day for the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So who are we to say when it should be? No man knows the day or the hour or the time. We just need to be ready. Because the promises have been fulfilled for Abraham, for Noah, the promises that were fulfilled for Israel and Moses, the promises that were fulfilled to Joshua, the promises that were fulfilled to the kings as they sought God through the years, the promises that have been fulfilled in Christ, who fulfilled so many Old Testament promises, the promises of Jesus himself, that have already been fulfilled. And we lose hope. We lose perspective. We lose a sense of clarity about what is coming. Jesus said, I am coming soon. I don't know how long soon is. I don't know if we've got another thousand years to go or a thousand days. I don't know what we've got. I don't know if it matters, quite frankly. He's the God of time. He gets to do what he wants. Nothing I say is going to change that. But he does say he's coming soon. Let's keep going in Peter, because it's interesting what he has to say. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Isn't that what we think? That's what we think. Be honest. It's what we think. Let's see. My grandfather believed Jesus was coming again. Dead. My great-grandfather believed Jesus was coming again. Dead. Dead. My father believes Jesus is coming again in his lifetime. He's getting older. Thankfully not gone yet. He's getting older. I did not think I would live to see my 10th birthday on earth. I was eight years old when the gas crisis of 72 hit. Lines. It was Ar Armageddon was coming. The end of the world. Vietnam was going on every night. Tom Brokaw, you know, the... Anyway, I'm sorry I'm dating myself significantly here. I'm not young anymore. I used to be... This really does bother me, actually. I used to be one of the young West Region pastors. I'm still not old, but I'm no longer one of the young West Region pastors. Time marches on. Time marches on, and yet he has not come. And am I to say, why is he slow in keeping his promise? Why does he delay? Does that get to be my call? What are the words of promise that give us life today? He says this, The Lord is not slow, as some understand that. See, we just don't quite get his relationship to time once again. 
Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You, your spouse, your children, your families, your friends, your neighbors, your community, your world. And then Peter says, just abruptly, but here's how it's going to happen. The day of the Lord will come quickly like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you ought to be? Excuse me, ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt with the heat. But in keeping with this promise, here's the other promise, not just that it'll come again, but we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth and a new order of things. And the new order of things is where righteousness dwells. Full circle. The serpent's head has been crushed. God is going to put everything under Christ that Christ may deliver it to God as a footstool, that everything might be under God who is supreme, that all the world may worship him. We're told that at the end of time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That's a lot of confessing. That's a lot of people making their statements. That's a lot of recognition. Let's help people do that before Judgment Day, not after. Let's hasten his coming. I didn't used to think that was possible, but if he's patiently waiting for us to be ready, how can we hasten his coming? being ready, and sharing what he's done with those around us. We do have an impetus to share. So I'm going to leave you in this camp meeting series with this word of hope and this word of promise, because these are words of life. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Please stand with me and let us sing our closing hymn, We Have This Hope, number 214 in your hymnal. Please.
May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the permeating presence of his Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.